It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here is Douglas Coleman. Well, hello there, hello there. Heidi, Heidi, ho there. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? How are you? Thank you for joining us. Nice to have you with us, as always. Today is our live special. No, the show isn't live. You're hearing it pre-recorded. The movie is called Live that we are promoting. And we have got Sean McBride, who is an actor in the movie, and also Michael Green, who is the writer, director, producer. The film is an interesting one. It's about a private detective who's hired to find Linda Johnson, who's abducted while live streaming on Facebook. And it's sort of like the footage found uh, Blair Witch ish, except it's done mostly on Facebook Live. And it's a thriller. You've got to pay attention, though, because there are comments streaming along as well as the movie is going, and you've got to kind of do both at the same time. So if you can walk and chew gum, you'll probably be okay. I watched the movie. I really enjoyed it. I think you will, too. It's available on all the usual streaming outlets. So check it out. It's called Live. When you do the search, search Live Linda Johnson to make it easier on the search engine. Otherwise, you'll get all kinds of stuff that you probably don't want. So Sean is up first, followed by Michael. And before we get to them, just real quick announcements. If you like what we do here on the Douglas Coleman Show, please check out our GoFundMe page. We would really appreciate any contributions that people can make as we're trying to upgrade and improve the show and perhaps get to a two-time-per-week show, but currently right now we can only afford to do once a week. So check us out on GoFundMe, gofundme.com, search Douglas Coleman Show, and we're the only one on there. Thank God. If you want to do subscription packages, we have those available as well, as well as sponsorship packages. Please check out our Patreon page for that at patreon.com forward slash Douglas Coleman Show. And for as little as $40 a month, you can be a sponsor. We will run your audio ad on our show, which will run eight times a month over all of our affiliates. And then it will also go into the archive and it'll stay there forever. So if somebody calls up that show, your ad will be there. A permanent fixture of that show. So check us out on patreon.com forward slash Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, we will be right back with Sean McBride. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Sean McBride. Hey, Sean, how are you? Hey, Doug, how are you, man? Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for coming on. I watched the movie earlier today. The movie's called Live. Earlier today. That is commitment, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I just I had to get it fresh in my mind, and so I watched it a couple hours ago. I loved it. I thought it was great, but... Oh, that's uh, that really makes me happy to hear, man. Thank you. <laughs> but, but there's always a but, right? Um, of course, of course. But I was a little confused, and I think... We'll be okay. You know, one thing, I have a lot of people on film, uh, filmmakers and actors and things, and it's difficult mm-hmm. to try to talk about a film without spoiling it, right? You don't want to give it away. Yeah, yeah, I, I know I know what you mean, but I think there's a lot of interesting aspects to this movie that I think people would find very, very cool that would only help them and make them enjoy the experience even more. Well, I I agree. And what I was going to say is because the film isn't one of those types of films that everything resolves at the end. 
No, no. I mean, because well, that, that's the the thing about it is, you know, it's it's really a, a modern day Blair Witch Project thing that we were going for, where it's a, you know, it's found footage, and all you have is the footage that's there. And I mean, in the real world, when you're trying to portray something that's real, you don't always get all of the answers or all of the resolve necessarily. I mean, you know, what we were able to do was it's like, you know, the movie itself is the private investigator who's bringing his case to, uh, to the police of where this woman is, you know, basically being held against her will. And, you know, the evidence that he has is all the Facebook live streams and what goes out there. And I mean, it's like right. and we're shooting this as if, you know, because we actually ran a fake Facebook page and <laughs> we're show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like a we got her where Linda Johnson who's the main character. She had over 3000 real friends and we were posting her live streams, you know, kind of. But they were in this shot in the exact same vein as a real person who would do it, where it's like, you know, they'll be on there for a little bit longer. But I mean, if you were to go on Facebook Live right now and I just want to check in with people around the world, I mean, that's kind of how they're doing it. And that's how we were doing it, where it's like you give people a little bit, but show her world unraveling. And yeah, I mean, true to life, it's just like every type of video that we had in here was either a Facebook Live stream kind of the upper angle interrogation room shot of uh, the police station. And then it was security cam footage. So that's all that's out there. I mean, if we were doing searching or something like that, and they had such a much bigger budget than us, I mean, they were able to do so many other things. But I mean, we were kind of relegated to, okay, anything that we're using, it's got to be publicly accessible footage. And that's what pieces together and yeah, I mean, there we, we do leave it with a little bit of a cliffhanger at the end there with what, you know, you find her, but it's kind of like, is does she die? Does someone else die? You know, that and then that's just, uh, you know, that's that's economics. You got to leave room for the sequel, right, Doug? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's funny that you did a fake Facebook account. You're lucky you didn't get deleted because uh, oh. that, that whole situation with Zuckerberg and uh, the security issues, oh. he went, they went through and deleted thousands of Facebook accounts. That would yeah, have been a real oh, drag. I know, I know. I mean, and that was also, I mean, it's kind of, that's another funny story in and of itself, right as we're about to launch, because, you know, we ran this account for a year and a half and we're putting, you know, we're basically creating the source footage for the movie while running an actual page with a woman that everyone that's friends with her is assuming, you know, she's really putting, putting her life out there. And, so we're doing it. We actually had to have the main, the actress Kelly Green delete her Facebook page because we didn't want to have two pages where it's like clearly the same lady. So we deleted Kelly's page, and I mean, she basically lived as Linda Johnson throughout this entire year and a half process that we were going through this. But twice, Facebook actually reached out to us and they had suspended the account, assuming it was fake. And we had to go through this whole process of, I mean, we <laughs> took Kelly's license and then hired somebody that was a graphic design artist oh, to kind of go in and, you know, basically doctor it to make it look like Linda Johnson. This is a real license. And then they had to take like a, have her take a picture, but they wanted to delete it. There was definitely suspicions as to whether or not it was real, but we were able to get through all that. And now it's kind of like everything's up there. It's still up. Like anybody, if anybody wanted to look up Linda Johnson, I mean, she'd pop up and you'd see her as well as the, the the assailants and people that are in the movie itself. We had fake profiles for them, too. That way it's like when real people are chiming in, we're having our actors chiming in, you know, kind of doing it that way. We were when we were going to pull it all down and, you know, put together the movie, everything would check out and you'd, you'd see it. It was like like a live soap opera where, it, you know, you start with a woman who goes into it innocently enough putting her life out there, talking about her mission. She wants to help people, all this thing. But in the process, she's divulging way too much personal information. And the people that ended up abducting her realize she's a perfect mark for abduction. She doesn't have any family. She's coming out of a relationship. She gets laid off from her job. It's all these different things. And it's just her out there, you know, just putting it out there like so many people often do. And I mean, and that's really the, the whole purpose of it was, you know, kind of to, to really hit home the lesson of, you know, be careful what you put online. <laughs> People should be a little bit more, you know, playing it tighter to the vest with what they're doing because everybody just hops on thinking, you know, I'm the next Walter Cronkite. <laughs> I'm the next Edward Murrow. I'm going to, you know, tell you know, you, people get like that. And that was what we had because it can become an addiction, but a, an addiction in a bad way. You know, you're on there way too long, putting too much stuff on and 
you know, bad things can happen as evidenced by our movie. Well, right. I think it's interesting that you, that you actually had her sort of live the character. I mean, that that's taking method acting to a whole new level. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you, you saw it. I mean, she's 85% yeah. of the movie. Uh, and she did such a great job and was so convincingly real. And that was that was what we were going for all along. I mean, this is because people, they want to compare us to Unfriended or Searching and those other movies. And it's like, well, they would not have been able to pull off what we did. Um, um, no, you know, they, they got a, way more money. But I mean, if you were to watch Searching play out on Facebook Live with them trying to play it off like it was real, nobody would have bought it. That's why everything we did was done meticulously. That way it's like this pl comes off like it would be any other person doing this on Facebook. You know, it's funny you said Blair Witch because when I first started watching it, that was the first thing that clicked into my head. It was it that, oh, Blair mm -hmm. Witch. It, it has that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and that, you know, that's another one where it's like it had whole, like all that was left, all they had to go on was the footage that was found. And you got out of that movie with lots of questions. You know, like, exactly. what the hell did I just watch? What happened to these people? And it's like, you were, if you think it's real, in the real world, people disappear and nothing happens. And that was also a large part of this, too. I mean, we were making a statement with this film, just kind of, you know, if you don't have the means or a family, I mean, it's like if you go missing, you have to have a support system around you that's keeping your name in the story. You know, keeping your, your your name out there, like the fight alive to find you. You know, there's a lot of people, and it was really just, it was uh, the young black girls from Washington, D.C. that were just going missing and nothing happening from it because they had grown up in the system. They were foster kids. They didn't have a family or people that would look for them, and it's like they're just gone. You know, and to this day, nothing has come of that. And so we tried to model Linda, her upbringing, off of that same thing. We wanted her representing these people that nothing happens when they go missing. And it was kind of that. And the movie itself is she's got a few friends and they're the ones that the cops aren't doing anything. So they hire a private investigator and then he's the one that ultimately brings his case to the police. And that's what you're seeing in the movie. But yeah, I mean, we wanted this to be real. We base everything that happens in the movie, especially the most suspenseful parts. All of those are based on things that have actually happened to other people. We just had Linda being – she was the vehicle of experience all of this on behalf of anyone else that it's ever happened to. Because, again, it's all to, to come back to the main point of, you know, A, don't put so much of your personal stuff out there. But B, what about the people that have gone missing in similar ways as this and nothing's happened to it? So we were, we were tackling a few different things with it. Well, I still have a couple of questions because the movie, mm -hmm. like I said, the movie doesn't answer all of them. Uh, you don't really know what happened at the end, which I kind of like because then it gets your brain going and think, okay, well, who did this and who did that? But all right, so you were the guy who was the sort of creepy one with the distorted voice and the mask. Yeah, yeah. And that that was uh, – I, I kind of play a computer hacker right. who is just very dissatisfied with the current state of affairs in the country and just everything that's happening. You know, like kind of see what's happened to Linda. She's an example of every the other people that this has happened to. And so I'm – you know, my character is very – cocky and thinks he just like I'm one step above everybody else as far as you know being a hacker and you know you think you you, you think you've got it perfect but it's like I can ruin your perfect world right now I, I kind of was just trying to channel every guy that you see do that but also the reason his voice and have a mask is because that's also classic internet for nowadays where it's like you can have people kind of operating completely unchecked and as big and as bad as it and as powerful as my character thinks he is He's still too scared to reveal who he really is. You know, it's that everybody on the Internet is always hiding behind something else. People aren't who they claim to be. You know, that's what the Internet has provided us with. It's a space where people can kind of be whatever they want. They don't have to be the person that they actually are. They can portray it like they've got the, you know, the perfect life. And so he's kind of he's rallying against that, but also as caught up in it as everyone else, but too dumb to even realize it. You know what I mean? So okay, but how does he get? How does he get involved with Linda? Um, he becomes he's one of her friends that's on Facebook. Oh, okay. And All he's right. if you if you pay attention, I mean, it's one of those where it's like you know you, you kind of got to go watch it a few times. 
when you see the commentary that's popping up and people commenting, especially during it was like the traffic chase with the cop that is right. he was trying to abduct her. You know, it's that stuff where it's like just as things starting to go bad, he's one of the people that are commenting that are concerned about her. And then she goes missing and nothing, uh, you know, n nothing happens. It's like there's people and you see actually if you were to go to her actual page, you know, when we posted the video of her actual abduction, um, you know, there's people commenting like what happened, like coming in a few days later, like what happened. But again, nothing happened. You know, even though that happened on Facebook Live, nothing came of it. People were still concerned. She was still getting messages, um, all all those different things. So he's he's one of those people where it's like, why aren't the cops doing something? Why isn't anyone like, what happened to this woman? And so he starts digging in deeper and is able to, you know, through hacking in the dark web, basically finds a chat room where she's being held on the dark web to get auctioned off. And that's something that happens too, where you have people on a live stream and I mean, they basically get auctioned off. People are bidding with Bitcoin to be able to watch a real life snuff film. You know, oh, do they want to watch okay. somebody get murdered live on camera? Right. And so he finds where she's being held and it begin is tipping off. You know, initially he, I don't want to give everything away, but he brings that, he starts helping the private investigator, the private, Eddie okay. Hill, who was an actual private investigator and uh, a former DEA agent. But we wanted him to play it real, like kind of take us through you would any missing persons investigation. And that's what we did. And we filmed him conducting it. But he's working with him and then they basically find out where she is. And through his hacking, he's able to drop a ping and find out where the signal's coming from and what's going on. And then it becomes a race against time. Can we get to her before she dies? Well, I got to advise anybody who wants to watch the film that you really got to pay attention and you've got to read all of the the comments coming through because it does help you out. It's not yeah, yeah, quite exactly. it's not quite like a regular film that you can just sit there and sort of watch it. Now, the other thing is would that film work on a big screen like in a theater? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the you know, part of the re we shot everything on a 4K camera. Okay. And that was to allow us the flexibility of, you know, we live in t today where everybody gets everything on their phones and so many people are looking at their phones and getting all of their content, their news, their videos. I mean, watching movies on their phones, we figured that was where it was going to be. But in the event, if it were to really take off and people were liking it and wanting to see it on a big screen, we shot it in a way where everything can get converted and you won't lose any quality blowing it up on a, on a bigger screen. If anything, I think it would look much, much cooler. I, I saw it on a relatively big screen at uh, the post-production house, uh, KO Creative and Beverly Hills that came on board. And they were really the ones that spearheaded getting us a distribution deal. They were super behind the project, thought it was very innovative. But I got to see it on a big screener at their office and it was really cool. But I mean, that was probably a quarter of the size of a uh, you know regular movie theater screen, but uh, yeah, I would love it for it to take off and get to the point where maybe they'd want to throw it in some theaters because it would be you know a pretty it, it would be you'd be watching it and it's like you're watching your phone but on IMAX you know <laughs> well, which exactly. could be kind of cool yeah so the film is out now right uh, yes yes the film is out right now you can download the easiest way to get it is searching live uh, on iTunes live and if you search Michael V Green who's the director or my name Sean McBride it would pop right up but uh, it's also on Verizon Fios Frontier uh, Amazon Prime Direct TV Dish Network Sling TV and then Google Play Vudu Xbox and PlayStation. I think that's all the on-demand tiers that we're on right now. And then I think in another month or so, they'll start shopping it to Netflix and some of the other other ones where it wouldn't involve pain. It would just be part of the – you can stream it whenever you want. And I think that's ultimately where the film's going to live. It'll it'll probably do well with the – you know, if someone they just – we live in this binge watch society somebody will oh i watched both unfriended and i watched searching what else is there and then if you like this you might like this and then live will pop up but uh, we're not there yet right now it's still on demand so if people are interested and intrigued and want to check it out they can go on any of those tiers that i just told you about and uh then the other cool thing and that that's been they didn't i i thought they should have i guess it was probably just a little bit of 
hesitation from the distributor of letting people know, hey, this was actually done on a, a real Facebook account, <laughs> but they didn't want to put that in the in the promotion at promotional efforts necessarily. But what's been really cool is the amount of people that have seen the movie and then have gone on to Facebook and then found, oh my God. All of this stuff is like up. And if you start scrolling through Linda's thing, and we're still accepting friend requests and everything because at the end of the day, the most important part is to make the point and try and get, hey, everything that happened in here was based on real events that happen to real people every day. And so if it gets those stories back in the news, then we've really succeeded with what we want to do, accomplish with the film. Well, it's definitely a good message, and it's definitely a good way to get the message to people, to sort of give them a, a what-if scenario and, you know, kind of mm -hmm. portray it all out. I've never used Facebook Live, but it seems to me that Facebook Live sort of blew Periscope out of the water. Like, it's kind of the same thing. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Well, you know, it's Periscope, and we've now seen this several times where, you know, Vine came in, and that was huge. Yeah. And then Instagram came in, and they were like, we're going to just have something that we can offer that's the same as Vine, and it wound up blowing Vine out. Now, now, now Vine is gone. <laughs> Similar with Facebook Live and Periscope and even Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. They have kind of the live features where you can go live. And it's really cool because when you go live, everybody in your friends gets a notification that you're live. And so it actually affords you an easier way of reaching people than if you're just doing your standard typical post. But yeah, Facebook Live, it totally did away with you know the, the end of Periscope. But what it was is this, you know, people started taking it upon themselves like they're hosting a TV show, you know, a reality show about their lives and, you know, carrying it around. And, <laughs> and yeah, it, it was, it was good. Periscope had, had the market on it, but once Facebook and Instagram got their fingers on it, it was like, adios Periscope. But it's that same thing where everybody feels like they're the star of their own reality TV show on there. Um, and, but the difference between Facebook Live and, you know, real reality TV is, and that, and that's kind of why like people are like, man, some of these streams were long with Lyndon. It's like, but that's how they are. <laughs> if you were to go on and watch somebody, it's like, wow, this is, you know, really long and, you know, not a lot seems to be happening. And we have it where it's like, yeah, there's ones where it's long and you're getting to know her and nothing's happening. But when stuff starts happening, it gets intense quickly. Uh, but that, that, that's what it is. If you were to go watch Facebook – and I don't watch Facebook. The only time I've ever watched Facebook Live was when I was doing research for this project and just kind of seeing it. And it's like, okay, this is how we've got to do it if we really want to stay true to this being real. But yeah, if you, you, if you were to go on there, I mean sometimes you'll just have like hot women just sitting there in a bikini and guys are ogling comment. I mean, and it's that kind of thing. Right. Those are the people like – you know, you got to wonder like who's just sitting around – watching people on Facebook Live, but you go on there and it'll be like, oh my God, this person has two million people watching them right now all over the world and then you watch and it's like, she's not doing anything. <laughs> she's just standing there talking about her ham sandwich. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it becomes a little, but people love it. You know, I'm not one of those people, just, just like as it sounds like you're not necessarily one of those people, but that is what's in and that's kind of what has is become. <laughs> Um, I always use the comparison of – did you ever see the movie Idiocracy, the no. judge film with uh, Luke Wilson? I mean it's basically this guy, he – I don't know if he goes to sleep or has an amnesia. He, no, he gets frozen, um, and he is like average across the board, like just a, a C student and everything. But he, he like volunteers to get frozen and come back out like in the, in the future, and when they unthaw him, he's now the smartest person in the world because – the world has, you know, de-evolved, and you have it where it's like the most the, – the president at the time, and that, that's why a lot of people have referenced this, was Terry Crews' character who was a reality show host or like a reality star, and that guy's the president. And the pop, most popular TV shows are just, you know, people – it was like the number one show is just a collection of, you know, random guys getting kicked in the balls <laughs> and that <laughs> – and like people watching that. But like you look at how things have become. It's like President Trump – was a reality show Absolutely. host. And the most popular yeah. videos out there are people falling on their face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like nothing gets bigger. They call them the fail videos, epic fails. You know, somebody, it's like a, you catch a person in their worst possible moment, and that's what people love. I wonder if the movie The Truman Show was sort of a precursor 
Yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't even thought of that, but that's so true. I mean, that that was, I mean, it's it's prophetic in a way yeah. of how the society loves watching other people. Because that was you long know, and, before social media and all of it, you know, when that came out. Yeah, I think, yeah, social media hadn't come out necessarily yet, but at the beginning of reality TV, you know, Survivor was out there. Right. Uh, other thing, but I mean, you see that, yeah, that that was where it was going, and I mean, you got a that whole movie. I mean, it was, yeah, I got, I'm gonna have to go watch the Truman Show again after this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you see the obsession society has watching other people living just their normal daily lives. What are they gonna do? How how is this gonna be handled? You know, and it's just kind of gone to the you know the tenth power, the hundredth power with where we're at now in 2018. It's just it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I I agree with you. I'm not one that watches, you know, somebody doing their hair or cooking their dinner on on the thing. I mean, who cares? And yeah, <laughs> I also I also am protective of my private life and like and I think that the message that you're putting out is really important, especially for people with kids because you don't know what their kids are doing in there. And God exactly. knows who they're talking to and there's all kinds of creepy stories. It's just, it's not as safe as you think because there are these people that can hack and find out exactly where you are. Exactly. I mean, you think I'm in my bedroom, the door's locked. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm fine. Everything's going to be fine. And it's like, no, that's not the case. <laughs> you don't realize, you know, just how easy somebody can watch and hone in. And then, you know, you start figuring out a person's patterns. And where they're going to be, I mean, and, and you have it where it's like when we show it in the movie where it's as simple as like, you know, Linda a couple times has people just coming up on her because they know where she's going to be. She's streaming at all times. Like once you turn that camera on, anybody that's got access or can get into get into that phone, it knows the GPS exactly where you are. Oh, she's only a mile from here. Perfect. You know, it's that. Yeah, we really wanted to show the ease with which total strangers can have access to you, even if like, well, I wasn't even friends with them. But if you're on there and like, I need to get more people and it's all about who's watching, when you get on that live stream, anybody can watch. Anybody has access to you. But people, there's that, you know, they can't get past the, oh my God, people are watching me. And that's what it's about. It's the addiction to that. People are taking interest or I'm beyond, you know, doing this. I'm a, I'm a stand up comedian. So I have no it's like I get enough of that fulfillment. You know, I can get on stage and experience that right then. And then after I'm done, it's like I'm done. I want to just kind of, you know, slip back in. I, I get enough of that fulfillment on my end through that outlet. But most people don't have that outlet. And that's why you see things like. Oh, I'm I'm streaming on Facebook Live, or I'm in. They have an, a word for it now. I'm an influencer. An influencer. <laughs> they actually had to come oh, up God. with a word for the people on because, you know, it's it's a big problem where you get these social media stars and you know people listen to them and they're really good in you know thirty second or one minute bursts. But when you start getting into like, okay, we want to use this person in a half hour format or put them in a movie. They get exposed for not having the necessarily proper training, and it's like, hey, it gets a lot harder to hold somebody for longer than a minute. That, that kind of thing. But uh, you see, it's just it's so much with you know people and the way they approach that they they don't realize the dangers that are that are really out there. Well, it's true, and also, a lot of times people get very bold, like you said, you know, with the social media that. The old saying is that everybody is seven feet tall on Twitter. and <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you have people that will go on the cam or go doing their phone, the Facebook Live, and they'll do all kinds of stuff that they would never do in, for real as yeah. a sort of a show. But the thing that you're putting out there is this entirely different persona of yourself. And people are watching mm -hmm. it. And I don't know if yeah. that's just if people do it for their ego, it's like their alter ego. I mean, I, I suppose it it allows you to do that, this type of I technology. Yeah, right? I think it's a superficial feeling of the emptiness that, that person might be feeling inside. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like anybody that's getting on there and, and doing it and kind of like screw what could happen. This is about me right now. They're They're trying to fill some void in their life. 
And, you know, I, I get that. It's just it's a shame. And if people want to do that, that's fine. But, you know, just enter into those waters a little bit more carefully, I, I would say, is kind of the hope. Because it's like you're never going to be able to do away with it. You know, people are always going to be have that obsession of, you know, what does other what do other people think about me? You know, searching for that validation. But, you know, I, I think there is the, the right ways to do it. And yeah, I mean, I guess if anything, I feel sad for the person that feels like they need to go and take on this totally different persona and then live through that. And I mean, it gets to a point where it's like you're living this fake persona more than you are your actual self. Right. You know, and I mean, that's where it gets to be, uh, I guess, a little bit dangerous. You know, like if you're going in and creating this whole character based on lives, you got to figure at some point you want to use that character to, de- to deceive somebody else. You know, I mean, that's <laughs> the catfishing. The catfishing. That's just what too. I was going to say. You know, it's funny because I'm probably a bit older than you, but I remember when uh, we first got Internet and a computer and of course, me too. You, the first thing out there was sex. You know, this was like mm-hmm. the, the new thing. It was kind of like in the late seventies when all of the X-rated theaters disappeared because you could get VHS. You know, so why watch this stuff in public when you could take it home and watch it privately? So when the internet came out, and now all of a sudden there's sex cams. Okay, I got mm-hmm. that. I understood why there would be a market for that. Okay, especially in the day and age of AIDS where it's safe, it's a fantasy, it's safe, two consenting adults, it's fine. But when Mm -hmm. it started to evolve into, like you said, somebody making an egg salad sandwich for 20 minutes, and people are actually just sitting there watching it, that's when it lost me. And I said, you know, this is is ridiculous. Who wants to watch this? And, And but yet there is a huge market for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's just, you know, I don't know if it's jealousy or what but i mean i'm sure people will look at somebody that's got a bunch of people watching them and think you know like i i would like that that would be nice to have people just ogling me and watching my every move um i can see that uh i get but yeah i guess it became a you know once you know you think oh you know that's just sex workers would do that and that makes sense but then when other people started like no i'm just doing my day to day and seeing that that got pot, it was like it spread like an infection. And now so many people are doing that, just on there, just mindlessly talking about how <laughs> bored they are. Like I remember I went on – I was at a bachelor party in Vegas and uh, my, my buddy Chris who was big on Periscope. Um, he's actually – he's on the Rich Eisen show. Um, he's a, a sports guy. He was Periscoping. At uh, my buddy, it was at my buddy Eric's bachelor party, and there were people on there watching. And guys, like a guy complained, he's like, "This is the most boring bachelor party I've ever seen in my life." And it was like we're watching sports in the middle of the day. And my buddy Eric was like, "At least I'm not sitting at home by myself watching other guys at another dude's bachelor party." <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> you're knocking us. Like, who are you, man? <laughs> you know. But it just, yeah, there, it, clearly there there is a market for it. It's not going anywhere. You know, I guess if that's the case, just be a little bit more careful is all we're saying. There was one thing in there that was kind of hit home for me. Was at the point after she separated from her husband and she was supposed to go on a date and then she got stood up and mm-hmm. there was this whole thing about this is so ridiculous now that you have to screen your dates through an app, you know? Mm -hmm. And to me, I just kind of scratched my head and went, yeah, you know, that's, there's something wrong with that. If you're going to go on a date, it's got to be like you meet somebody, you like them, you want to spend more time with them. The computer Mm -hmm. shouldn't really be in the middle of it. Unfortunately, it is today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... That's – and yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Uh, and I was going to say this before. It's like I, I feel like I'm – my generation is the, is the last generation of the old way of doing things. <laughs> you know, I, I graduated high school in 2001 and it was – I remember vividly AOL Instant Messenger. I got an AOL Instant Messenger oh, account when okay. I was in eight, eighth grade. And – seventh grade it was like i was going through puberty it was like before you know right before i started puberty there was no internet (laughs) by the time i was done with puberty internet was everywhere 
You know, it was like that year of seventh grade was when things really, really started changing. And it has evolved so much. But I mean, and even still, like, it, you know, stuff like the day, it was only in the last few years that the dating apps have popped up. You know, before, I mean, you had Match.com and Plenty of Fish and eHarmony, but then now there's Tinder and Bumble, and I'm sure there's other ones out now, but I, <laughs> you know, I'm in a relationship, so I'm not on any of those. <laughs> Um, but like all of that stuff and it, it, it just changed things, you know, before like the old way we do things pre-internet. Yeah. You'd meet somebody and, you know, light, like enjoy the conversation and it becomes, I, I'd like to talk with them some more, more, and maybe I'd like to do more than that. And I mean, that's the natural progression of things, but now it's like, all right, what's the top five hottest pictures you got? You better put something witty in your bio and go. <laughs> and you're just like if you can't do that, like you're almost it's like you're froze out. You don't have a chance, and it sucks. <laughs> and so I, I think it also like that that environment and the way it's set up now that creates loneliness that leads people to hopping on Facebook Live, hoping somebody like you know a, a, a girl like Linda in L.A. seeking empathy from somebody in Chicago. You know, it's like if there's nobody around here, at least you know. These other people can help fill that void for me. And I think it, that's what it comes down to. And, and, and that scene that you're talking about getting stood up, you know, it's like, what does she do in that moment? She's sad. She hops on her Facebook Live to talk about it. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about this with other people that this has happened to. And it's like, well, no, it's you're sad. You're by yourself. You thought you were going to be on this date. You're feeling like a loner. You're feeling like a loser. You look across, you see a table full of friends. No friends here for mine. Let me go on Facebook Live, and then sure enough, somebody will be there to watch, and I can feel a connection with them, even if it's happening thousands of miles apart. And so it it just it just turns into a vicious circle. I suppose it is kind of a adulterated version of therapy. Um, yeah, but it comes with an awful lot of risk. Exactly, and, and and that's risk in the sense of like if you're going to real therapy, you're going to a certified you're doctor, to a doctor <laughs> yeah. that's certified. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As opposed to, well, that's uh, Les John from Sheboygan, Illinois. Yeah, or the you next. Know? <laughs> it's like, what does he do? Well, he's a mechanic. That's great. But we're not talking about cars right now. <laughs> or the serial killer, about- or, you know, you don't know who's out there. You absolutely don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but it uh, everything contributes to, to to the you know at all the, the social media, dating online, to the stream. It's just everything is ruled by the internet, and I just wish people were strong enough to like. All right, it's fun. the internet's not going anywhere, but maybe can we all figure out how to take a little bit of the power back <laughs> to the people yeah. versus we are controlled by the, you know, the robots and the technology. And I mean, think of how many times you've just been talking with somebody about something and then you hop on your phone, you're scanning through on Facebook and all of a sudden there's a banner ad of the exact same thing that you were just talking about. Yes. And it's like, how did it know? How did it know? <laughs> Cause they're listening and they're watching everything. Yeah, those things are creepy. I mean, you go on a site and looking for an airline ticket, and then you go somewhere else, and the airline ticket's popping up in your face, and it's it's very creepy. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, you know, like I, I searched a flight on Southwest Airlines, and then two weeks later, call. We knew you'd be calling. You still <laughs> want to get that flight to Vegas? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big Brother is watching. Uh, Sean, yeah. we got to wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I hope this film does I have, well. I hope it uh, gets out there and people really get the message of what you're well, trying to Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I've uh, really enjoyed this conversation. I think you're going to have a great conversation with Michael, our director, as well. Uh, he did such a good job with this. I mean, a lot of people, <laughs> they'll ask us, and you know, how, how what made you do, do this? And it's like, well, it was also, you know, we made the movie we could make. You know, we'd love to make a $200 million movie, but we wanted to have a movie that had a message, but also something that we could produce. And that was this. And 
really proud of it. I know Mike's really proud of it. I'm glad you enjoyed it and allowed me to come on here and explain a little bit of about it. And hopefully, we piqued the interest of some of your listeners, and they'll they'll give us you know check us out and maybe leave us uh, a review either on IMDb or iTunes. Those those five star ratings go a long way, listeners. So. Please do that if you can. But, Doug, I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a blast, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to you again sometime in the future. All right, Sean. Thank you for coming on again. I really appreciate Take it. Take care. Nice talking to you. Thank you. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Hi there. This is Stuart Epps, record producer. This is my story about Elton John uh, working with him in those early years, going back to 1967 at Dick James, uh, all the amazing tours, those first recordings, uh, going through to Rocket Records, and uh, it's an amazing story about his incredible rise to stardom and my part in that. So uh, look forward to taking you on that journey. So here we go. Yeah, and to order this great audio CD, please just email me at stuartepps at talk21.com. That's Stuart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Epps, E-P-P-S, at talk, T-A-L-K, 21 in figures, dot com. Stuart Epps at talk21.com. Email me and I'll give you all the details for buying this brilliant audio disc. Thank you. Bye. Tired of living in a culture of lies, fake news, and alternative facts? The Pro-Truth Pledge reverses the tide of lies by calling on politicians, and everyone else, to commit to truth-oriented behaviors. The Pledge asks signees to commit to 12 behaviors that research in behavioral science shows lead to truthfulness, such as clarifying one's opinions and the facts, citing one's sources, and celebrating people who update their beliefs toward the truth. Private citizens who sign the pledge get the benefit of contributing to a more truth-oriented society. Public figures get more substantive rewards for signing the pledge in the form of positive media and public recognition. The pledge crowdsources the truth by asking volunteers to evaluate the statements of public figures who sign the pledge. Take the pledge, demand that your elected representatives do so, and encourage your friends to take it at protruthpledge.org. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Okay, please welcome... Michael Green. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Douglas? Good. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Um, I just talked to Sean, and now I'm going to talk to you. You were the writer, director, and producer of Live, and I just watched it this afternoon, or a couple hours ago, I should say, and uh, I really liked it. It was good. Um I always get a kick out of movies that just kind of end, that <laughs> that it doesn't have like a, a real finish to it, you know what I mean? Because right. it, it kind of leaves you thinking and you kind of want to go back and watch it again. The other thing that was interesting about it is that you really have to pay attention because you've got to read all of the comments that are coming through on Facebook. And, and that's something kind of different. With most movies, you don't have to do that. So you have a little bit more work to do, if you will, or responsibility when you watch this film to kind of get everything. Because I had to ask Sean a couple questions like I didn't understand a couple parts of it. But uh, that's good. That's a good thing for me. So I guess my question to you is how did you come up with this? I've been pushing more of a traditional like shop a script and get funding 
more traditional path to get movies made. And this has been like an eight year process and, and I get really close and then things fall apart and um, probably the story of a lot of filmmakers. So Sean and I were actually working on this pilot that was rooted in kind of this uh, um, kind of like a war of the worlds, uh, like the radio broadcast, like like something that seemed very real. So it was a newscast, but we were doing vi like a video newscast where uh, we, we were making we were kind of rebooting this idea of, uh, of the tingler um, William Castle's uh, movie, called The Tingler, and we were making it like modern day, the Tinglers are back and they're attacking the planet or whatever. And so we did it in this newscast kind of a thing. But by doing that, I did a lot of research and I, you know, I just, I think just subconsciously doing that and knowing I had to start getting a film going just any way that I could, I think. I just woke up in the middle of the night. It was it was actually about a year ago, October. It was in October, and I woke up in the middle of the night. It's like four in the morning, and I said, "You know what? How would Orson Welles? What would Orson Welles use if he was in today's times to put something out there that would seem very real and really have people question it? And he would use social media platform. And and I think Facebook at that point was really pushing their live, you know, their, their live player or whatever it's called, um, their live functionality. And I thought this is just, th this is the medium we can use. We can, we can use this. And so by November we opened up a real Facebook account for Linda Johnson and that's how it started. So you wrote the script sort of on the go. I mean, like as you were doing this or did you have the whole thing, already mapped out and then just gave it to her and say, okay, do this. Cause I know Sean said that she kind of lived the part for, a, she did. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she did. So she, so the woman playing Linda Johnson, uh, conveniently is also my wife. So, oh, well that uh, is convenient. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter actually scored the film as well. So, um, we, it was very much a family and friends affair. And so, um, you know, she got off of Facebook. She put on a um, she, she altered her appearance a little bit and she definitely lived this part. But to answer your question, I did write a very detailed story about Linda's backstory and then kind of what was going to happen to her over the, this, this course of this year. And we figured we would be doing it for, I think, six months. And then we ended up actively maintaining her page for over a year and a half while we were making this. So, so there was kind of this broad outline and then some very detailed things that I needed to have happen for this story to work. And then as we were going along, I was also editing it and I, you could see where there were certain holes and, and it gave us kind of this lens of, okay, what are we missing here? Okay, easy enough. Let's go shoot that. And 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 just to kind of add to the story. So yeah, it was like, uh, it was, but it wasn't a traditional screenplay. So it's more of an outline and a story. And everything that you see on there um, by these amazing actors I got to work with was all improvised. Okay, so like all of the comments that are coming through when she's talking, like when she's sitting there drinking the wine and telling the story about the uh, the fake cop that pulled her over. And, you know, the comments are coming through on the Facebook chat. Those are all improvised or were those written out for the people to to type? Oh, OK. So so that well, I'm glad that it looks so real. So what that was is those will differ. Those are a little bit different than what actually happened on her timeline. So, so when that, for instance, that scene when she's talking about when she's really shaken up, uh, we had shot that probably six or eight months prior to actually putting that on her timeline. So there's a way that you can stream a live, you can, you can push pre-recorded content through Facebook live. And so we did it that way. So we had to, for the film's sake, we had to create comments. But then when we actually ran it through her actual Facebook page, there were actual comments that differ from what you see in the film. 
for two reasons. One, we would have to get people's permission to use their Facebook, actual Facebook profiles. And that, that just wasn't really conducive to being able to create the film in a, in a timely manner and get it to our distributor. No, I was just trying to figure out because it did seem very spontaneous. And I mean, obviously people can create a scene to look spontaneous, but I've never seen yeah. it done in this manner, you know, using a Facebook chat and a live feed. So it was it was something new for me to watch. It was interesting. I asked this to Sean, and I'll ask it to you again. It seems to me that this film would be better to watch on a smaller screen. I don't know, because if you were in a big cineplex, would it be more difficult to read all the stuff that's coming at you? Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. I, you know, but I, 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 but I agree with you. I think that I think that people, you know, ideally when I made this, I wanted to see this in theaters. But this maybe just isn't the film that gets in theaters for me at this point. And so seeing it, it, it does feel more natural to watch it on your computer or on a smaller screen because that's how you view Facebook anyway. Right. That's that's what I mean. I think it would be a little yeah. bit, uh, I don't know, um, out of place might be the way to say it if it's on yeah. a huge screen. But if you're watching it on your computer, then that's exactly where it's supposed to be. So it seems exactly. more natural there. Yeah. No, it was good. And I, I liked how it kind of the end where you're not really sure. You know, I like films that kind of end like that. <laughs> because if it's like The Wizard of Oz, where it just has a beautiful, happy ending and you you know that it was all a dream for her, there's nothing left. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't keep your brain thinking. But when films just kind of yeah. end like that, yeah. it, it it keeps you more involved with the film, even after the film is finished. So I, I sort of like that. Well, it, it, it really served two purposes. Um, number one, unfortunately, in real life, you know, sometimes you don't have things wrapped up perfectly. And there are things that are unknown. And we there True. sometimes there yeah. aren't answers. But the other function of that was we can do a part two and we don't need anybody's permission to do it. So I kind of wanted, to, I, you know, I wanted to leave that up in the air to do a part two if, uh, you know, if we, you know, if this performs well, that will be a real conversation I'm going to have with the distributor is let's let's do a part two. So we'll see. But another thing you brought up is going back in maybe watching it twice or watching it three times, I want this movie to, to hold up to repeat viewings. So if you have to go in a couple of times or rewind it and read those things, I think that's great. I think that's great because it's just like little, little Easter eggs that maybe pop up. And, and if you look at the dialogue on some of, uh, if you look at some of those comments and you look at some of the names, I think some people will be pleasantly surprised as to what they're seeing in there if they catch it. Well, I may have to go back and watch it again. I mean, Sean was nice enough to clarify a couple of points. But, you know, other people aren't going to be as privileged to have you and Sean to ask questions to. Right. So, you know, they would have to watch it a couple of times. But like I said, it's also a little bit of a discipline where you're watching her, but you've also got to read the stuff going on on the side, which that's right. kind of unusual. You don't get that. Um, even with a foreign film that's in subtitles, I mean, that's the closest thing I can think of is where right. you're watching the action, but then you got to read the subtitle to understand what they're doing with this. You know, you understand what they're doing, but you've got to pick up the the stuff on the Facebook, the, the chat feed, because that's, that's something different than what necessarily she's doing. So it's almost like two little things going on at the same time. Which makes and it it's very much unique. part of the story, and it's well. very much right, right, and it adds to the story. So, yeah, it's cool. It's uh, I like that. It's something different that uh, one doesn't get to see every day in a regular film. How's the film doing, by the way? Getting good reviews? Are you getting uh, a lot of plays? A lot. Uh, of we have no. Well, we don't know as far as tracking wise yet. We'll know a little bit more after this month. So it's been out since September 18th. So we got. Basically, from two platforms, we got some data on what it did in September, because I think they're basically a month behind. So there's this elusive VOD world, and 
it's very difficult to get information on how well films do. So I'll know more at the end of this month, I guess. We, we did a, the distributor did a very big social media push um, through Facebook and Instagram um, for about a month. And uh, according to the social media company, it just outperformed every expectation as far as engagement and feedback and, and clicks to whatever, I guess, wherever they were sending people. So, you know, hopefully that translates to, to people watching this and telling people and we get a little bit of word of mouth going. But the good thing is that, you know, with other films that are in this genre that, that um, have, have had bigger releases, um, like the Unfriended franchise or Searching that was just out, I think the good thing is that, you know, we, we did this for probably what their craft service budget was. So, <laughs> you know, and maybe, maybe I'm half joking with that, but it probably wasn't far off. And so, you know, I think that the, just from a business standpoint um, and our responsibility to the, to the people who, the generous people who put, put up the money to do this, you know, is that they're going to get their money back and probably a little bit more. And hopefully by doing that, we'll be able to roll this into a part two and have and, and kind of answer some of those questions that are that are left up in the air, because we've got a, a nice direction I'd, I'd like to take this in and still staying true to this found footage genre and staying true to doing it on some kind of a, a live streaming platform. Maybe it won't be Facebook this time oh, or the yeah. next time, I should say. Oh, there you go. Yeah, move it over to uh, one of the other ones. Exactly. Um, we got to wrap this up, unfortunately, with two interviews in one show. We don't get a full on for with everybody. So I got to okay, no problem. Got to wrap you up. The film is called Live, and it's available on all the usual Amazon Prime Video, uh, Vimo. Right? Where else is it available? Yeah, um, Vudu, um, iTunes. Pretty much every platform, uh, with the exception of Spectrum um, and AT and T. So, Directv, Dish TV, all of that. It's you just have to look it up. But the one thing is, when you look it up, it's best if you look up live, and then also type in Linda Johnson. Live, Linda. because okay. yeah, if you just type in live, a lot of times, unfortunately you'll get like Rolling Stones live or every concert <laughs> that's ever been filmed in the history yeah. of concert films. Unfortunately, hindsight, we would have maybe changed the title, but that's how you look for it. And, um, and uh, hey, we hope uh, people get out there and watch it and, and enjoy it and, and um, give us some feedback. We'd love to hear if, if this touched people because there's definitely a bigger message, underlying message, um, to this is to watch what you put out on social media. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It was nice talking to you and best of luck with the film. Great talking to you as well. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guests, Sean McBride and Michael Green. This is Douglas Coleman saying, please check out the movie Alive, Linda Johnson, and I'll see you when I see you. Yeah.